Alright, so I don't know if any of you guys have uh, seen this, any of this uh, before. Uh, my name's uh, Nick Thorpe and I work for ThoughtWorks. Uh, and I'm Fiona Seisman and I work for Lunar Tractor as an Agile coach. Yep, and uh, th we have a blog called Agile Board Hacks and um, we g gave a similar talk a couple of years ago to uh, Agile Australia. Um, so what Agile Board Hacks is about is about you know, if you've, if you've worked in Agile teams or around Agile teams, you'll see like little improvisations that they're sort of doing next to the board because they want to visualise something. They want to get some visibility into tech debt or into um, things that their team is working on or to solve particular problems that create visual indicators. Just add a, I'm not talking about anything tidy or neat, I'm talking about little scraps of blue tack and index cards and just those little hacks. So we are kind of anthropologists of that. So nothing we're showing you today is really where we're pointing to ourselves and saying, look what we've done, isn't this awesome? We're, this is stuff that we have seen out there in Agile land and we've gotten permission and taken photos. So we acknowledge you know, all of the work that's gone into making those. So this next 45 minutes is all about those little hacks. It's all about creating a place for a conversation uh, around a little a, a visual indicator of some kind. Some of this stuff is, um, if you've seen another version of this talk, we'll pick up a couple of ideas and carry them on, and most of it will be completely new. Um, when, when we go through and talk about each of these things, um, we're going to be talking about them in the context of the particular problem that that team is trying to solve. So we're going to be talking about, for example, tech debt or, for example, um, happiness. I don't think we are talking about tech debt. For example. But for example. Yeah, for example, <laughs> tech debt, happiness, things like that. Um, you see in the program it, it mentions 3D. We are going to get into some sort of 3D visualisations and 3D board hacks. One of them involving an olive container. Um, and we, we'll, get, we'll get there. We'll, we'll sort of get there toward the end. So we are going to cover that stuff. Cool. Yep. Oh, and we'd really love... So like Nick said, these are not ours. Like we, we get them from visiting people and people telling us about them. So if while you're watching you go, oh, I've done something a little bit like that, um, we'd love for people to share them. Like if you've got some... It, it reminds you of something you did. So we'll, we might prompt a couple of times during for some sharing, but feel free to share at any moment. Yeah, or interrupt with questions at any time, yeah. or, hey, I've done something like that, or we did something like that. That makes this all the richer. And, and if you get stimulated by this to show something that you've done, get in touch on the blog, because it's really supposed to be a clearinghouse of hacks that we can share with each other. Yeah. Next? Yeah. Nick and I, by the way, practice this with a clicker and everything, but... Now we've had to put it on this vast... Right, so, uh, you know, if you're, familiar, <laughs> if you're familiar with your classic kind of uh, burn-down chart... Oh, my God! This is, this is a burn-down chart. These hacks are a place for a conversation. We're going to come back to this again and again and again. Sometimes, you know, you're standing in front of a board and you're going, what is this board not telling me? What, 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 what these things are about is about creating a place to have that conversation. If you've ever been in a team, for example, and you've had to have one of those difficult <coughs> conversations about when are we going to finish or this needs to be done by September the 14th, you will know that a burn up or a burn down chart is the place to have that conversation. It gets both of us looking at this instead of at each other and it gets us looking at where this line's going and where that date's going to finish up. So that's a, just an example of a place for a conversation and a simple kind of board hack. Um, and so just really briefly before we start, I, I don't know how many people in this room are new to this Agile Lean stuff or not, so if, forgive me if you are really familiar with this, but I just wanted to touch on um, why, why, the, why visual controls. Um, and so some of you might have seen this before, it's, it's been in a few, ver few um, presentations here and there, but this is a, a plane that you, any of us might get in tomorrow to fly to Sydney or somewhere in. Um, and can anyone tell me what jumps out at you when you look at that mo essentially modern plane? See. Sorry? Lots of yeah. Yeah. Yes. There's many things. There's many things. But there are many things because each one of those dials is showing you one thing, and each one of those dials is is a dial. It's a key thing as well. Um, not an electronic readout. So you can actually get information by glancing at those dials rather than having to process the information. Um, and humans are kind of built for visual recognition in terms of where we've come from. It's really important to be able to kind of see that, um, I don't know, cheetah or something coming at you out of the forest. Like that, that 
something in your peripheral vision, we're very good at processing, and at any given time, 20% of the blood in our brain is powering our eyes and our vision. So um, the thing to note here, like I said, is they're all um, analog, or even if they're electronic, they're replicating analog things. They're, they're not giving you numbers that you have to process, because if you look at a number that says 58, and suddenly it says 68, that's pretty hard to notice. But if you look at a dial that kind of says 58, and now it says 68, and it's in the red, that is actually quite a visual, you'll see that quite um, readily. Um, so that's kind of why visual controls are really powerful. Did you want to add something, Nick? No, I was no? just going to say that's the great thing about a dial, right, is it's got empty and full on it and it's got that little, oh, there we go. There it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is just kind of some of the, the basic, uh, I call them rules, Nick says they're guidelines around visual controls <laughs> um, that came out of, this is Toyota, um, and lean production systems. This was their Maruka, they call it, the Japanese word, um, for visual controls. And it's, like Nick said, they, they need to have some kind of uh, full and empty indicator like this dial. So you know half is okay. And in fact, if it went a little bit, you still wouldn't worry, but you might worry when it hit the red. So it's very, it's very visual and it, you don't have to think too much about that. Um, so they need to be easy to understand, uh, which is about that context. It's about having one thing per whatever it is you're trying to measure. So, uh, you know, a chart or something on the wall with 10 different things on it still requi requires that um, computing power to actually work out what that chart's telling you. So it's always better to have one per thing that you're measuring rather than one measuring 10 things. Um, they should be big and easily visible. So this is that concept of an information radiator versus an information refrigerator. Does everyone know? No, I can see a couple of heads. So a radiator is when you walk past it, it, you can see it. You don't have to make any effort at all. It's telling you stuff as you go past and radiating information out. Um, and whereas a refrigerator, if you don't open the door, you don't see it, right? You, can, you don't know what's in the fridge. And so if you imagine an Excel spreadsheet coming around via an email. Who reads that, right? It's a fridge. You don't go in there. Um, and they should be interactive and easy to change. And that's basically because this stuff changes every day. Um, you know, today we're on half, but if we've gone driven a bit further tomorrow, we're a little bit lower. So it needs to be really easy to update that stuff, and um, that usually means it's low tech. For Nick and I, that means it's you know whiteboards and sharpies and post-its and blue tack, because also that means it, it doesn't look official. Anyone can come up and change that if they know that actually the information on there is wrong, and you don't have to go and reprint a spreadsheet and blah blah blah. So that's an interesting thing to watch. So in yeah. a team as well is. This is no one's job, okay? Yeah. Making out these little things to visualise problems, it's not, you know, it's not the IM's job or the technique's <laughs> job. It's a sign of a healthy team. People who can see that there are problems should be feel free to go up and go, well, look, I came up with this little hack and we'll show you some later. Uh, for example, one about people who mapping the patterns of conversation in retro. It should just be that kind of visual thinking ticking over and everyone should feel absolutely free and able to go and start visualising stuff themselves. So that's kind of the basics of how you would... Does that make sense? Any questions on a wavelength here? Yes. Okay. Cool. cool. Um, I'm not going to go into this particular slide a lot because it's on the blog and we've talked about it before, but this is one where we've actually we had it a couple of years ago and some play people have taken this and kind of built on it and, and expanded on it. Just as a quick intro, this is, was basically um, a list of, of people down there on the left and skills there across the right. Um, and, and a map of who could do them. So uh, if, if you've got one half, you can do it. If you've got two gold things here, you can teach it. So you can easily, if you don't know how to do something, you can find who to teach um, or, and you can see who not to ask, like me down here in this example. But anyway, that was just a quick intro because Nick's going to talk about it a little bit more about how, how some people have taken this slightly further. So let me just go actually to this one slide after this probably shows it better. So uh, at Telstra, uh, there's a, a very large, so a large group of people, 120 people on a, on a single floor, eight or nine teams, took that idea and, and expanded it up. So I'll show you the wall in a second, but it's, it's probably the skills wall probably went from here to there, had 128 niche skills on it, and had um, something like 100 people, eight teams down the left-hand side. And what, what happened there was, we were saying, okay, we want you to just put three, we went around to each of the individual teams and we said, we just want you to put one of three words into these spaces. Either I have that skill, I can teach that skill, I I have it and I can teach it, or I want it. Okay, and then that was scaled up, you can see the teams down the side here. And then that was scaled up, if you go back, 
to this size. Right? So that was right across the wall here. You can see all the teams running down the side there and all of the skill, <coughs> niche skills along the top. Right, so what's going on here? This is pull-based learning. So too often we hear about training plans and we think about pushing training onto people because these people need to get this training. What we did was, on this floor was the teams, we said, when are you having to send work out of the team? What are the things that are slowing you down? What kind of skills would help you to go faster? And then they can basically come to this wall and they can pull those skills as they need to because they can see, oh my god, Fiona's got that skill. She uh, understands the Glassfish reporting tool and we need to have that skill. So maybe we can set up some pairing with Fiona where she can come and sit uh, with us for an iteration and pass that along. So it's self-serve university, self-serve pool-based uh, learning and teams know best what it is that they need to, what they need to do with their skills. And the, the, the interesting difference for me on this was that, that addition of the want skill. Yeah. Because that one previously kind of just assumed that everyone should have all the skills potentially. But this is actually highlighting in red there where people really want stuff. Yeah. Next? So, yeah, let's go again. So then... Again? Yeah. So then at Bank West, they pick that idea up again. So all of this stuff is pop culture. Teams pick it up and they remix it. Or they take an idea like a burn up and they reuse and remix that idea, for example, to show finances or something. So <coughs> this is Bank West who took a similar idea. You can see they've got a really a lot of skills there along the top. The people down the side, they're using a similar sort of coding of want, have, teach. But look at this. They've gone along and they've where they think there's these YouTube people really should talk. They see a really good collision here of someone who wants a skill and someone who can give it and they've gone along and put little bits of gold on the wall just to call out they say, come on, you guys really should talk. You want to learn this stuff and this person wants to teach you. It's like a telephone exchange. So it is like a telephone exchange. Yeah, yeah, clearly, just like a telephone exchange. Right, so self-service, pool-based learning. And technically, that's a 3D board hack. That is no, a 3D board going into the third dimension right there. <laughs> okay. Um, ah, okay. So this one is... Um, ThoughtWorks had a competition for the best card wall recently that um, there were quite a lot of entries for. And this was, I think, the winner, if not the winner, a runner-up winner, um, and uh, I think it was Pearson in the UK. Anyway, they um, they needed a way. They'd been talking as a team about the theory of constraints and limiting their whip and having too much going on, which lots of teams do. And you often see that people have um, physically limited their their grids on their wall to only contain two cards. But these guys actually went further than that. They, they, they wanted to emphasise that that constraint moment where, sure, we can do all the thinking we like up the top and we can have all the done output that we want at the bottom, but we really want to visualise the impact that actually there's only one, um, one or two in the case of tasks for these guys to be in play at any one time. And I'll just jump onto the next one that they drew. So, so they literally, you know, standard practice for limiting whip, they said we're only going to have three lanes of development at any one time. Um, I don't know, they had three or maybe they had six developers pairing. Um, user stories in the top, highest priority in the left, feeding down into these hourglasses. And then the bit I kind of like too is they've got a, a space to break out tasks under those user stories if they need it and, and also gather them up. And their rule was that they could have two tasks in here. Um, I don't know why. They, they decided that, that was okay. Two tasks could be in there. And you can see that two tasks would physically fit in there. Um, and, and so those, um, it's, it kind of highlights the, the, the conversation around breaking out the tasks, the flowing through the tasks, collecting here, and then finally the story is done, is done down there. Um, so for me that was just kind of like, I'm not sure why this goes one from everyone else's point of view, but for me it was like, I'd just never seen, I'd always just seen people limit whip limits in the same old, same old way, but this was the, the team's <coughs> solution to actually visu visualise that bottleneck. So this idea has also been spotted, uh, our anthropologists in the field have spotted this uh, out <laughs> of Telstra in the uh, EDW part of Telstra where they have a, a fantastic scaled agile, scaled up agile working system and one of the things that they said about it was, it was working well for them was before stand up, watching the, the, uh, the team sit around actually get there early for stand up and talking about what's next out of all of these possible cards at the top here that could be played, what is the one that we're going to pull down and why? It's good for promoting that conversation. Yeah. All right, are you ready for the snake? <laughs> this one is just going to poof. Okay, uh, so I just need to just stay with me for a couple of minutes while I talk you through the snake. Uh, so this is, uh, I don't know, hands up if anyone's heard of the model that Spotify is using for their 
agile development, right? They're using an idea of tribes. So th this, in this situation, this is again uh, at Telstra. Uh, the IM here, the kind of mastermind behind this is a guy called Graham Robb, who's working there. Um, so this team are, this is, this is a tribe, right? This is more than 30 people. There's sort of four sides to this building and each side of the building has a tribe. And the, the interpretation that, that they're working on here is that this is a group of 30 odd people who can reconfigure into as many different sub-teams as they want to depending on demand. So if they've got like a long single project coming in, they might say, okay, well let's form a team here to address that and then let's have a group of three or four people here who just take the little tasks as they come through. And so as demand changes, this group of 30 people can reconfigure themselves into s groups of smaller teams. Right? That's how they are working the tribes model. That's the first thing you need to know to understand this. So that creates a whole lot of puzzles then for how would that board work and, and what, what, sort of, what sort of problems do, do, do we need to solve now? So they created the snake. So uh, this wall is really long. So it's it's probably as wide as this room. I've tried to capture it there with a, with a kind of a panorama. Um, this it is, goes from lowest priority to highest priority. So there are two problems that they were trying to solve here. What's the problem? Why would you make such a crazy board? One, all of the teams operating wanted to be able to see absolute priority of everything they were working on at any given time, right? So this is highest priority, that's lowest priority. Think of it like a backlog, which normally we see backlogs top to bottom. They wanted to be able to say, for example, well, this little sub-team of the tribe here, is this thing more important than that? Because they might want to trade off some resources. They might want to you know, put some more people onto that, or, or they might want to, for, for whatever reason, they needed to know absolute priority. So to get more space on that wall, <coughs> they curved their backlog, and they went from highest priority to low. So that answers the question at any given time, what is the most important piece of work, and is this more important than that? And that was a conversation that was not happening on that floor, and it was causing chaos for this Right. Then this goes from, um, uh, where does it go? It goes defining done, in progress, and done. So here's my feature in this case, and it's going to move from defining done into doing and done. So there's my process lanes running this way. And now the second problem. So the first problem they have to solve, absolute priority. I want to be really clear on the priority of this piece of work. Second problem is, this is scaled agile. So these guys... Some of these little sub-teams are working on features. A feature might take a couple of months to complete. And some of them are working on tasks. Some of these things, are, these are of radically different sizes. So that's what I'm saying, XL to XS. So cop this. If you're working on a feature, they have a piece of string that comes down and they hook it into one of these grids here. And then they use that as like a mini board for all of the stories that make up that feature. So you can get transparency into exactly where that feature's up to. This is like a mini board here. See, that's done. So you can see exactly how far through that feature is. There's another one. And so the teams can make use of all these little mini boards all over the place and just bits of string to sort of break out and zoom into a feature if it's a big piece of work. And that's actual string big, is that's it? That's actual string. <laughs> okay, so not my we got more We got more string. string. <laughs> so then if we go to the next one, Sorry. just to zoom in on that a bit, then how do you know that these guys use commitment-based planning? So what they do, they put a little target on the ones that they're planning to finish this iteration. So it's a lot to take in, but if you stand in front of the state, you can see who's working on what, you can see what's targeted for this iteration, you can see the absolute priority, and for the large pieces of work, you can see exactly where they're up to because the boards, it has those little, little breakout grids. Did that make sense? If in you the don't end? get Did that, I, I, I kind of still yeah. don't get it, so don't feel okay. bad. I have a fairly simple question, though, which is yeah. I've just spent a fair bit of time explaining that to us. Mm. One of the functions of a board, of an agile board, is for people within a team to know yeah. what's going on yeah. and people outside a team. Yeah. How well do you reckon this works for people outside yeah, a team? Yeah, I think it's tough. But the, what he's done, actually, <laughs> is he's got a lot of these explanatory things around it. So he's actually got several, like this one here. Uh, and like There's one, how to use this wall and what's this for and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, it's a bit of a... I think there would need to be some dedicated training of some of the higher yeah. level stakeholders <laughs> on what they need to look at. That's a pretty full on hack. That is a pretty full on hack. But it's a particular problem they're trying to solve. It's the yeah. problem again, Charles. Absolutely. <laughs> Probably <laughs> is, yes. <laughs> oh, sorry. The thing from the snake, that's, that's what's in, at the front of it, is what's in progress at the moment. Yeah, well, so the stuff which is in the orange state is the stuff that is in progress right now. And this is the highest, this is the head of the snake, so this is the highest priority stuff. So it's like a backlog that's flipped. 
So when this you way. change the backlog, do you have to move the whole thing? Uh, you're just moving the cards. You, when you're picking up a new feature, you're forcing someone to make a decision. Is this more important than that? That's a yeah, really good conversation. Because as I guess as the time goes, you, you're going to start finishing from Pulling the things off. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, 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 and probably moving things up, <coughs> and putting them all up, and putting in new things at the front. Mm -hmm. Yep, the same. Mm. Do the stakeholders come to the wall? <coughs> But on this floor, to be honest, the, the stakeholder engagement's not that great anyway. <laughs> 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 yes. Such as this could be why. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. No, it's not. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> um, so from the high, the kind of high tech painted on the wall, at large snakes, we go to a tiny Dave sleep deprivation scale, and a few people in the room will probably recognise this, um, although Dave himself is not here. Um, I just want to include this one because it's basically the airplane dial, right? But you don't need to have an airplane dial. You can have a card and a bit of blue tack. And, and this, the problem here was David just had a new baby and he sometimes was not coping very well. <laughs> and he was also the, pro the content product owner for releasing um, a website and having to make some pretty hard decisions uh, on a daily basis. And so his solution was to have this little dial that literally went from one coffee, i.e. I'm feeling all right, I've only had to have one coffee, through two coffees to three coffees to, oh my God, I'm going to hang myself. I had so little sleep last night. And so the, the idea of it was that he could set that and then you would kind of know how to take his answer for whatever question you asked him. <laughs> so you might come up and go, you know what, today's not a day to ask that question. Of Dave, I'll come back tomorrow. Or you might come up and go, oh, I've got to ask him today anyway, but I might sanity check it again tomorrow when he's down on the one cup of coffee. So it's kind of a bit of a jokey thing, but it was an actual problem they were having with some of the decisions he was making. But um, so low tech, low tech, and and again back to that idea of a dial. You, you know where good is, and you know where bad is, because you're up in the red. Yeah. Okay, this is um, so in our. Th this one's on the blog already, and we talked about this last time. This was a team that noticed, as I'm sure you have in retros, that some people were talking a lot more than others, and they just started sort of mapping it out. And it started out with someone in the team just putting a dot for each time someone spoke. Then it went through all these evolutions that we sort of went, that we've got on the blog, different remixes of it that different people picked up. And this was kind of the final version that which actually showed who was talking to who. So you can see there's a vociferous gentleman called Gus here who's talking rather a lot. And there's a guy down here called Doc who I happen to know, you know, he's only spoken once in the whole meeting, but mind you, he would have made that count knowing Doc. But, um, so so this, this sort of idea came about. Then someone saw this on the blog and they noticed the pattern of their stand-up that the team was actually almost functioning like two sub-teams. And so they made a similar map of their stand-up, but they included what the conversation was about. And sure enough, there was one group of people who were just purely talking about this one feature in the green, only to each other, which was a simulator, and another group who were only talking to each other um, about the orange feature. And one of the things that this team kept doing was it kept pulling in sort of more whip. And it was actually what they figured out was they really were functioning as two sort of sub-teams. And this was part of the evidence for that. This was a place to have a conversation about, hey, why can't we swarm around this feature? Did anyone else try these heat maps, if, if anyone's seen them before? I've done it. A couple it's of nods. Is that done live mm -hmm. during the stand-up? Yeah. The person speaks and draws a line? Uh, he actually, yes, he did that live. Yeah. yeah. And that so there's someone, there's someone live. drawing. So you don't have to draw as you speak, because there's a few of us like me that can't do that. Um, uh, <laughs> so this is a typical problem, right? You're always late for stand. Someone always late for stand up. Um, and you see, we've seen it solved. You have to do a dance if you're late. You have to pay a dollar. Maybe you have to sing a song or something. This team decided that actually they wanted cake <laughs> as penance for stand up. And and again, the problem's not new. The solution's kind of not even that new. But I, I like this hack. And the reason that I like this hack is they've got a definition of done down the bottom. It's kind of, you know, they're not too specific about it, but it can be jam donuts or slice or, or anything. They're not too fussy, but so, so cake is, you know, um, okay, defined yes. down yeah. here. And the other thing is, so, so someone's printed this up. Someone's made the little avatar. Someone's printed out the cakes and organised all this. They've started running with it, and then someone else on the team's gone, yeah, but I could jam like 20 slices of cake next to me up here before I have to bring it. And so they've come along and actually said, no, here's the cake line. So there's the modification on the hack that someone in the team has done. And Jen is actually overdue for cake, it appears then. <coughs> but, um, but this is it's kind of back to my point about the, the team just evolving it as it's, as it's required and being able to say, even though that was printed, they still just 
prettied it up with a with a pen and made it do what they needed to do. Because someone will always try and game bring in cake, right? Yeah. See, good. I like that, I see, like that's that better. Thinking. That's it. See, who's, who's here works with Dan? Just tell him that he needs to fix that up when he. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like that. All right. So opportunistic board hacks, right? So we often have to, have to work in environments where there are the wall police. Put your hands up if you've had a run-in with the wall police. Yes. <laughs> right. You can't put that there. You cannot put anything on that wall. You can't put anything on that window. You can't put anything on that post. In fact, in some environments, you can't freaking put anything anywhere that lasts overnight because you have to pack everything back in activity-based working environments at the, at the end of the day. So what do you do? So we call these opportunistic hacks and we go around collecting these things as well. So these guys here were on A380 to Chennai, didn't have a board, no problem, use the bulkhead in front to do your planning, take a photo of it. Um, interesting thing about the building police as well, so there's the actual building police who come into the federalities who will come and take your stuff down. To, you know, tell you to take stuff down, but more often than that, I come across people who say, oh, you can't do that, they will stop you. And we say, well, it's just blue tape, let's see what they do. And I tell you, <laughs> eight times out of ten, nine times out of ten, they never show up. So uh, I encourage you to deface the walls of corporate Australia. Come <laughs> <laughs> on, it's out, we must. Um, this is uh, people, obviously, they were not able to put things on the wall, so it's gone on the window. Probably done that from time to time. I've also seen uh, walls on the window where people have to wear sunglasses to read them because they get incredibly backlit. Yeah, choose your, choose your window choose your carefully. Choose your window carefully. Um, this one here was a horizontal uh, board. We were totally banned from putting anything on the pristine walls of this environment. Uh, it was in a knock in a network operations centre and so we created a horizontal board with half size cards on butcher's paper on a desk and we would stand up around this desk and work that way. Um, then this is a Bank West hack. So this is uh, activity-based uh, working areas, not allowed to put anything on the walls that was persistent. So this is a Dutch company that sells you these shower curtains and they're designed so you can put photos in them. Aha, I can put agile cards in there. And so we've got our process steps this way, just the usual thing, you know, our horizontal bars this way. And then they can actually pack it up at night because it's got those suckers so they can actually roll it up at night and they can avoid the building police. Yeah, shower curtain. We've got a link to that on our blog. If you, to you could also curtain. use that as a shower curtain at home yes. with your personal <laughs> Kanban. Organise your day. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so this is, um, I, I ran out of board, right? So this is <laughs> Josie and she's put a clothesline on the bottom basically and she's hanging the cards on the, uh, on, she's created rails underneath to hang the cards on. You might also say, hey, maybe that's a bit much width, but anyway. <laughs> uh, any more boards? No, no more boards. Um, anyone got any other boards, actually, that uh, they've I seen? I've seen you can uh, combine two boards together, so you have yeah. one and take the yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Um, <coughs> So how's the team feeling? So the, I've got a couple of hacks here about happiness. Um, and I wrote a couple of quotes down because Deming says that all anyone asks for is a chance to work with pride. And then Confucius says, choose a job you love and you'll never have to work a day in your life. And so as we all know, it's pretty important to be as happy as you can be at work because we're not probably all in jobs that we love so much that it doesn't feel like work. But um, and so. It got me thinking about happiness, and there was a discussion in an open, in an open, um, what do you call that? Open forum back at yeah. um, Scrum Australia, I think it was about about happiness. And I've been thinking about this for a while, about putting it on the blog, but I haven't got there. So there's a couple here. Um, this one came from uh, Personal Kanban. So in Personal Kanban, Jim Benson talks about one of the things he did was as he moved his cards into done, he put this little face or indicator of how happy he was doing that task um, or not happy as the case may be and that would actually give him some information to think about in relation to those tasks and so what he found when he did it was when he looked at all his unhappy cards or rather maybe when he looked at all his admin cards that were done they all had unhappy faces on it and so for him that told him that perhaps he should actually spend the money to outsource his admin tasks and his invoicing for a day a week or whatever it would have been. Um, and the only way he could get that, get that overall view of that is by recording the happiness because otherwise you just you know, grumble a bit with your invoice and then you've forgotten about it because you don't think about it the next week. So this was giving him the record. And so then he talked then about um, 
doing that within a development environment. And if you think about this is actually a card that Nick's mocked up because I have not seen this in action, so I'd love someone to start doing this um, somewhere. Uh, as a developer or the tester or whatever, as the card goes into done, it gets this sad face. So why has it got a sad face? There's going to if a developer is moving a card into done and they're not happy about it, there's something there that you've got to have a conversation about. Maybe the process was really crap. Maybe the requirements weren't ready. Um, maybe there was a whole lot of tech debt. Um, if you look at this one that, as I said, it's a mock-up. There's like what it's been in, it's in dev for four days and test for five days. And it just says, as a subscriber, I want to log out. It shouldn't have been that big, surely. But it was estimated as an eight. Anyway, the unhappy face it's just that marker for having that conversation, either at the time or perhaps at a retro a little bit later, um, to find out why. Because you don't want teams doing work that makes them unhappy all the time. Sometimes we have to do work that makes us unhappy, I guess. Um, so I kind of, I really like that idea, and I hope I kind of get to see it in the wild sometime soon. Um, and I've got another one. So the photo wasn't so good. This was off, um, off someone's blog. Uh, about charting the happiness levels in a team kind of over time. So I don't know, has anyone in the room done this kind of histogram where you, you take like a happiness reading maybe at a retro or, or at a session? So, so this team was doing that where they, they come in and every team member takes a post-it and, and puts it on, something's happened when we put this on the PC, but puts it on a, a line of one to six. Um, six is good because if you use one to five, there's a middle point. Here you've got to be a little bit more happy or a little bit more unhappy on one to six. Um, and this team was actually, they were putting um, their names on those post-it notes and, and perhaps a little note about what was making them unhappy. And so they were using that within their retro to talk through, but they also wanted to represent it out on their board for everyone to see, but they didn't want people's names sitting out here, you know, the un, you know Joe the unhappy guy, because everyone would then be on Joe. Why is Joe the unhappy guy? They also didn't roll it, want to really roll it up into an average, um, because you lose a bit of the context, and average there would lose that five or s it's become a six now. Um, and so they come up with the concept of, of these seasons and, and kind of defining um, which combinations of the happiness metric represented as rep were represented by um, a weather icon there. And so this one, you know, a bunch of twos and, and some threes and one six is maybe mostly sunny with a chance of local hail. <laughs> <laughs> this one's probably, you know, all ones and twos, you get sunny. And then, and they map, it's over time. So this is over uh, uh, four iterations, I'm guessing. It didn't actually say how long, but it is. They're recording this over time. And this is actually telling a story, because they started off sunny down that end. They've got a, a few local thunderstorms maybe here. They've got heavy rain here, and then it's a real full-on thunderstorm. So there's something going on there. Um, and they, would ha they had that there, so they wanted to be honest about what the team dynamic was. Martin. <laughs> they were about what the team dynamic was, but they wanted to just mark it as a conversation. So someone could come and ask about that without actually drawing any conclusions um, about who was happy or they had to have the conversation to find out the detail behind that. Whereas a histogram might give you the idea that you just, you know that three out of five people are unhappy and that doesn't really tell you anything. <coughs> um, oh, I just threw this one in because this is... Uh, it doesn't have to be hard, right? This is literally... They've just drawn this on the bottom of their board um, because this guy, Rob, was kind of one of those people that's either all on or all off. And so Rob would just... He'd just have it there and today's a happy day, today's a sad day. And that's <laughs> all they did. There was, there was not... You know, it can just be a whiteboard and a... And a what is that? Sharpie. Not a Sharpie. Not a Sharpie and a whiteboard. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, what time is it? Uh, I think we need to sort of keep moving. Okay, so we've got to kind of put the pedal down. This is a quick one. Ten minutes. So we have uh, features and stories, these, these sorts of things in Agile. We talk about the invest. You know, if these things should be independent. They should be negotiable. But the fact is, sometimes they are not independent. Sometimes they actually do have dependencies between them. And with this team, I know they tried incredibly hard to slice this piece of work into independent features. They couldn't do it. They had dependencies. And even worse, some of those dependencies were being carried by different teams. The dependencies crossed teams. So Kalisha said, OK, I'm going to show them on the board with pieces of string. So each of these are pieces of string showing that this piece of work is related to this, this one's related to this, this has a dependency to this one. 
And then, she, as she said, she said, at the end of each piece of string is a conversation. Right? This is just a reminder to keep communicating about this. And what these teams actually ended up doing was they were in different parts of a building and they all came and co-located so that they were actually sitting next to each other so they could make those conversations go even better. And the thing I like about that is, is like Nick said, the idea is that we should all have yeah. these independent pieces of work that you can work on, but it's not the reality, and so it's no point having a board that kind of gives yes. an impression that yeah. it is the reality. If it's, it's real, don't pass it over it, call it out. Yeah. There's a little icon thing in the uh, top right hand side. I can't remember what she was using those for. They denoted something else entirely. Yeah. It's a crystal. <laughs> these, are, these, these show which team's working on it. I can't remember what the emeralds were or the uh, sapphires. Yeah. All right, so we've got about 10 minutes for 3D, 3D stuff. Um, this kind of came to me when Nick and I were talking about the 3D boards that he's going to talk about. We actually, all of us, are maybe guilty of 3D boards because as soon as you start to stack cards on a board, you're actually using your third dimension, um, which can actually be quite a powerful... Um, indicator of, of something. So Nick's argument is often that, that you're stacking these cards out because maybe it's product planning backlog and you have a feature coming up later and you've got all the story cards behind it and that's a good thing and you can see the size of it because it's coming you know, this far out from the wall. Um, and I know there's a gentleman sitting here who would like try and kill me if I ever tried to uh, stack cards on the board because for him stacked cards meant we were doing too much work at once. There was too many um, stories on the release bus and the release was getting very, very risky. Um, and maybe the backlog was too big, maybe the wall was too small, but That's in our case see. that was never true. You can see what was underneath. You can see what was underneath. Remove it. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but the, the thing I take from it is it's quite a powerful indicator, that third dimension, because you don't see it very often. We, we're used to having the, you know, the x-axis and the y-axis, and, and the, that third dimension popping out. Is, is, um, so just on this front, so yeah, so you ran out of dimensions. So these were cards that all fitted the y, uh, the, the x-axis criteria. They were in that process step. They fitted whatever you had as your criteria for the on this side. It's probably, as I say, back in product planning stage. But you ran out. Normally, you would have a backlog in priority order, but you ran out of dimensions, so you stacked them in priority order. In that example, that's what happened. So then, here's an example here's of some more stacking. Another, another more stacking. This is a uh, fellow <laughs> at General Motors. <laughs> My Lego is more important than yours, right? So Nick's from Adelaide. He can't say Lego. Oh yeah, I'm from Adelaide, so we say Lego. Oh. You would say Lego. We say Lego. Um, <laughs> we're really fancy. So, um, so this man with his important Lego, he's uh, in the General Motors vehicle engineering operations, right? Now, his responsibility <coughs> is he looks at for a, for a particular for any given class of cars that mm -hmm. are coming off this production line, and remember he works in a real lean environment, a lean manufacturing environment, because <coughs> he's in the car industry. So he sees big visual indicators around all the time. He sees this method of problem solving. He wants to use a visual method of problem solving to answer the following question. Given that I have um, cars coming off the lines and those cars have defects, those defects arise during the warranty period. GM is liable to, uh, you know, has to, has to pay for getting them fixed. So given that there's, there's many defects in these cars, or well, there's a certain number of, given number of defects in these cars, which ones should I remediate first? Where do I start? Now this is a familiar problem to us, right? So these are, again, 3D stacks, but this time he's got Lego, he's got labels on the side of the Lego uh, that can identify the defects. So he, he ran out of dimensions. He had to show the defect, the ID number for the defect, the system to which it belonged, uh, the time during the warranty period at which it typically appeared, um, he wanted to be able to show the cost to remediate it and the status of that. So that's a lot of different dimensions to be able to do. So this dude decided to do it using Lego. Now I'm going to explain to you how this, this system works. It's kind of interesting. Um, so the horizontal, uh, I'm not an expert in it. I've just like watched the videos and read about it. I tried to contact the guy. I couldn't get him to call me. You must have thought I was some kind of freak. It's <laughs> 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 like, what do you want to talk to me about my Lego? Um, but this is what this is my understanding of it. Each of these is a subsection of the car, so powertrain, brakes, um, body, stuff like that. This is the weeks during which in during the warranty period that the defect appears. And so when you see a stack here, for example, this means that there's a defect here that's appearing in the powertrain during you know week three of the warranty period. These these are then the defects that are stacked in priority order. The size of the Lego block represents the um, cost to GM of remedying that defect out in the field, right? So this is a place for a conversation about 
which defect do we attack next? What these two here, these are sort of two different versions of done. And he's keeping that horizontal alignment so he can see here. This means I've got a temporary fix in place on the production line. So we've got kind of a kludge that is going to prevent this defect from coming out. And this one here, and he seems like he's only got one there at the moment, means we've got the full pokey yoke. So we've got, we've remediated it at a system level and we have a system in place to prevent it coming up again, you know, which is the equivalent of like leaving your wallet in your shoes when you're you know, at a house or so that you can't leave your house without your wallet. I looked up pokey oak and it's a real word. Yeah, it is But a I didn't word. get kludge then. No, <laughs> that's a Nicholas word. So yeah, so that, that's one example of a, of a 3D, a 3D uh, board. This next one, and the man who showed me this hack is actually in this room. Uh, you, you use something like a, a, this is a product planning, a three-dimensional way of visualising product planning. Um, and you use so something like this. So this was shown to me in a, like an olive container, like you'd have in the fridge. And I want you to visualise it. In the bottom of the olive container is a bit of styrofoam. Stuck in the styrofoam is some map pins. There. Okay? So here's the map pins. Now, first I want to, there's obviously, so when we're talking about boards, we've, we've only got that so much to play with. We've got position, right? We've got size, colour of the card, where is it? What's written on it? Maybe shape, that's about it. That's why we start to run out of dimensions. So, the colour dimension in this, what does it mean? The red equals a, a competitor's product. Yellow is the current iteration of this product, where it's sitting now. Green is the next iteration of it, and blue is the target state for that product, okay? Um, then this grid on the bottom here, and I'll, I'll sew all this together and, ex and explain it to you, um, represents two dimensions that this person is thinking about with their product. So if we think of this as a training product, it could be either task oriented, imagine this is like a computer training program, how do I do X, you know, if it's mingled, like how do I create a new card or whatever, or it could be command focused, like how do I use the menu system, right? So what this is saying is this particular competitor's product has been given a score of four on the command and two on a task orientation. So you can see there the mapping of tasks, commands, competitors, products, current, next, and future state. Now, we're going to bring in another dimension. So now up the side of the plastic container is ease of learning. How cool is this, right? So the one down the bottom, quite difficult to learn. Two, level two, getting easier to learn. Three, very easy to learn. So if we go to the next slide, you will now see this, this person. Here are his competitors, right? He wants his product to move up and away from those competitors, getting easier to learn and getting a greater focus on commands while staying around about a four or five in tasks. So when you look at that in three dimensions, you can actually see, if you flip through a few of those slides, maybe feet, you can actually see oh, sorry. how it's moving up and up. away from his competitors. <coughs> yeah, see that? Uh, uh. Yeah, one, two, three. He's going to get easier learning and he's going to head toward a command focus. 3D product planning. And this can be carried around inside. So um, when uh, Mahal showed this to me, he, he brought it in a plastic container, like, literally like this, pulled the lid off, and he's walking around with it in his bag. It was killer. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. The ultimate elevator pitch. Absolutely amazing. Right. Um, now, I've got about one minute to talk about the next, this next one, um, which is, it, it's kind of... It's a 3D board, but it's not, it's not for knowledge work. So if you think about um, a, the whole genesis of Agile and Lean is coming out of manufacturing and Toyota production systems and, and all that stuff. Uh, and we kind of can forget that what we're doing is actually based in manufacturing. So this is Baum, Baum Bicycles down in Geelong. Um, and James, who runs Lean Tractor, who I work for, has been doing a lot of work with them, trying to, to um, build them, uh, get them lean. They weren't... Uh, running that way and kind of um, apply a lot of Agile and Lean principles. So if anyone saw his talk at um, Agile Australia, he covered some of this, but I just, uh, the whole story, but I just wanted to show you his board because it um, it's pretty cool. The problem was what they didn't have one source of truth. They had um, a, they had a you know, checklists and lists of what people wanted built and then they had all the parts in the warehouse and then somewhere in a database they were trying to marry those together and know whether they needed to order things or not order things and it was a little bit chaotic. And, and those joins and handoffs are where we all know we all have problems. So their, their solution was to bring it all together into one place. And this, this thing's six metres lo uh, long, high, sorry, 25 metres long, and it weighs three tonnes, and it costs 25 grand. They had, to get a, um, they had to get a small business grant to build it. And it basically, it's their wall, right? It's, the, it's their backlog of work for customers. 
the whole thing's about three months long. It starts here. If you order a bike, you get a box here with all your uh, specs and what checklists and things attached to it, and all the parts go straight into that box. They know that it it's a three-month backlog, and so if they need to order parts, by the time it's coming around into <coughs> up next for production and into production, they'll have the parts by then, and they track it along the way, adding them as they arrive, checking them off. Um, there's a couple of points of no return. It can't move from here up until the customers pay their deposit or maybe had their bike fit, one or the other, I can't remember. Um, and this blue line is the real point of no return. I think it's got a, I think it's got a little sign there that you can't see where it can't go past here if it's not actually ready. It's got to have, they've got to pay, they've got to know what colour they're going to paint it, they've got to have all the parts in the boxes um, and they've got to have had the fit. Um, so then the other thing they do is they have a stand-up in front of this every day, like a stand-up that you or I would recognise. Um, they've got these indicators here, red, green. Red ones, um, something is really fucked up on that and they need to talk about it. This one's gone past the point of no return, so that's probably really quite serious. Green ones are all good, but orange ones have got something a bit dodgy, but it's in hand. So maybe the customer's coming in tomorrow or, or the, the check's clearing or something. Um, and the interesting thing for me, oh, the other thing is the customers come in and see this at the start, so it's a real visual thing for the customers about what is the backlog at, um, for, for their bike and how long will it take. Um, and, and, you know, that thing of it's not moving forward past this point until you've done, done your part, customer. Uh, what was I just going to say to you? You were telling me how when, the, when it's done, it creates a space and so that... It yeah, that's right. So, so when one of these is finished, these are all the ones that are in production. It's about three, three roughly a week that, that finish. So they would come out and then one of these next ones will come down into the slot. Um, and I've got a little video that I have to work out how to play because we couldn't get it in the PowerPoint on this nice PC. Uh, where do I find it? They're physical boxes. They're physical boxes. Yeah, check so, it out. so this this is them moving on rollers. Oh and that Jody's about five foot nothing and tiny, so it's not actually that difficult. But so they physically moved a moved a box, and then they need to actually have a. a she's got a hand. Is this one going to play? Yeah, just clip it A hand winch here to go from one to the other. Next time you hear someone complaining about updating the board. <laughs> <laughs> but so I'm not sure quite how any of you will be able to take this hack and recreate it in a, in a work environment. But it's just a good reminder, right, that our boards are representing the kind of knowledge work that, that doesn't have a physical presence. And, and here's the version that's the physical presence. Thank you.